Hello everyone and welcome to today's Connect and Learn webinar, Introduction to Trauma-Informed Care. It's great to have you all here for our first webinar for 2021. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we are presenting from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I would like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend this respect to those First Nations people who might be watching this webinar either live or via replay. My name is Rebecca and I'll be facilitating today. Uh, this, is, this webinar is part of a series, a Connect and Learn webinar series designed to support AAD clinicians throughout regional and metropolitan Victoria. And we also welcome all of our interstate viewers. Uh, these webinars are hosted by Turning Point and funded by the Department of Health and Human Services in Victoria. We really want the webinar to be interactive where possible. So we ask you to use the blue icon and ask questions. Part of my role will be to collate, you know, all of your comments, feedback, questions um, for our presenter at the end. We've allocated some time for all those necessary questions. Uh, there's also two resources available for you to download. Um, if you're watching this as a replay, feel free to email me um, and I will forward you a copy of those resources. We encourage you to, to stay until the end of the webinar. We do have a feedback survey, which we'd really appreciate hearing from you all. Um, but, you know, this is a really important um, topic for our sector, so I won't spend any more time and I'll introduce you to our presenter, Jen Thompson. Lots of you I'm sure will know Jen or have worked with Jen. Um, Jen has over 30 years leadership experience in the not-for-profit sector and over 20 years um, in the AOD sector in counselling, management and director roles. She now works in private practice with a focus on mentoring, coaching, and supervision of health professionals, managers, and leaders. We're really lucky to have her here today. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Beck. So I also would like to acknowledge our First Nations people today. This is such an important topic uh, for our traditional custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and all Indigenous people across the globe. So we want to acknowledge that colonisation has impacted these communities. And so if we look at these communities through the lens of trauma-informed care, we will see that their health issues, their substance use, mental health, family violence, incarceration, uh, have a direct link to intergenerational trauma and their own historical trauma. Uh, the objectives of this workshop really is to provide an introduction to trauma-informed care. It really is the tip of the iceberg and we're going to try our best to capture uh, an understanding of what trauma is and the implications for your work and a good understanding of what trauma-informed care is. I'm going to touch briefly on polyvagal theory, which is an important emerging theory which really helps us to understand trauma and also touch on the importance of self-care. So what is trauma? I'm going to actually share a quote from Sigmund Freud. I don't often quote Sigmund Freud, but I would like to provide his definition of trauma, which I think is really interesting. He said that trauma was a breach in the protective barrier against overstimulation resulting in an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. So we know that trauma is not the event, but the residual impact uh, for the person. And I particularly like Stephen Porges definition, which is that trauma is a chronic disruption of connectedness. So we know that people impacted by trauma, they have uh, disconnection with their own bodies, with their mind, with their identity. They have a disruption of connection with their sense of self and in their relationship with others. 
So we know that the prevalence of trauma is widespread and we know that uh, if you look at the Turning Point website, it states that up to 75% of Australians will experience trauma in their lifetime. Uh, we know that in the public behavioural health sector that it's probably more like 90% of our clients that are presenting that have a history of trauma. If we think of sexual abuse trauma alone, one in three girls and one in five boys experience sexual abuse by the age of 16. So we know that this is a widespread issue of concern. And in my experience in the AOD sector, I know that I could count on one hand the clients that have not had a historical trauma or an intergenerational trauma in their history when they present for substance use treatment. So why do we need to talk about trauma? Well, I want to offer Peter Levine's quote here, which is that trauma is the most avoided, ignored, denied, misunderstood and untreated cause of human suffering. And he goes on to say that addiction to substances is just one of many ways of managing the aftermath. So certainly in my work, working with clients in the AOD sector, this is absolutely true, that there is enormous suffering as a result of trauma, that substance use is a way of coping and I've also seen, uh, as Peter has outlined here as well, that people have an innate capacity to triumph over trauma and to be transformed. So how do you identify trauma? Have a think about how you know you're working with someone who's had a trauma history. You might think of the person who is pacing the waiting room or the person who doesn't like to answer their phone. You might see it in over talkativeness or an inability to sit still. You might see it in someone's posture being collapsed and withdrawn or detached. I particularly like this slide because it shows a mask of perfection. And I've certainly worked with people with a history of trauma who are very invested in presenting perfectly. And beneath that mask, there is this lostness or a sense of emptiness. And so we know that uh, there are people who we may not actually be able to tell from appearance that there is a history of, of trauma present. So what happens if we don't identify trauma? Well, I'd like to suggest that if we don't identify trauma or if we miss trauma, we end up with service systems that are really like hammering a square peg in a round hole. We have hoops that clients need to jump through that they're incapable of jumping through, or we may unintentionally re-traumatise our clients through our processes, through our service system um, requirements. And we might also end up with workers who are burnt out, workers who work too hard or are too invested in a particular outcome with a client or who get frustrated with the client not following through. So these are the symptoms of missing trauma in our work. Hottis uh, really provided some interesting feedback in his research of service providers and their attitudes about trauma. And he really eloquently pointed out that many service providers who do see trauma, see trauma as just an additional issue or an additional problem on a long list of problems the client presents with. And so he really encourages us to have a trauma-informed approach that presumes that every person you meet has a history of trauma that could be influencing their ability to trust you, their inability to follow through, their need for a safe relationship. It could be influencing their disengagement or resistance or their destructive coping strategies. So Hodis has really advocated for a trauma-informed 
approach that has an educated workforce and that considers trauma as central to all presenting health issues in both the primary health setting as well as in our mental health and substance use settings. So why would we consider trauma as central? Well, I come back to Peter Levine's quote, it is the most avoided, ignored, denied, misunderstood and untreated cause of human suffering. So how might this change the way you work with your clients? If you think about the people that you're working with now with a substance use concern or a mental health problem, how might considering trauma as central change the way you see the client? And how might it change the way you work with the client? My rule of thumb has always been to really honour the coping strategies of the client, to really understand that all behaviour is need-driven, all behaviour is communication. And what appears dysfunctional to me is functional in some way. So I really need to have a good understanding of the defence or the coping strategy that a client has and never remove it unless they have something better to replace it with. I really need to know its function. I had a psych lecturer many, many years ago who said to me, what's driving you crazy is keeping them sane. And I've repeated this in supervision sessions um, when I've been team leader or manager in programs. I've thought of this quote so many times when I've hit a brick wall with someone that I'm working with. What's driving me crazy is keeping them sane. So I really need to understand fully what the underlying issues are and what the functions of behaviours are. We understand that trauma has an impact on the whole person. It's not just a mental injury. So PTSD is not just a mental injury. It affects the whole person. We have one nervous system that interacts with every part of our being. So we know that someone impacted by trauma finds it really difficult to stay connected. It impacts their social engagement, their sense of self, their inner critic, their self-loathing, their harsh, punitive internal voice. It affects their brain development. So we know from Bruce Perry's work, the development of the child's brain when experiencing neglect uh, affects the size of the brain, the functions of the brain, the neurobiology. It affects our physiology, our body and our somatic experience and we'll be looking at that today. Our emotions, our senses are dysregulated and of course behaviour is impacted. So there's more risk-taking behaviour or behaviour that's withdrawn and isolating or behaviour that's self-destructive. And then there's the impact to spirituality or our values, our meaning in life, my sense of being, why am I here and who am I in the world? So every facet of our being is affected when we experience trauma. And when I started out in the AOD sector, we were introduced to the biopsychosocial model. It's such a great way of looking at substance use concerns and now bringing into uh, this idea the impact of trauma to our biology, to our psychology and to our social connectedness. So we need a treatment response that's holistic and attends to the whole person and attends to a service system that's integrated and collaborative. So thinking about trauma in this way, we realise that our trauma stories live in our biology and we have a vagus nerve that is called the wandering nerve. It meanders uh, all through our body. It's a cranial nerve that starts at our brainstem and impacts a wandering approach through our heart and lungs, um, our voice, the back of our throat, our digestive tract. And so uh, this, when trauma is located in our bodies, it impacts all our organs. And this is really helpful to understand because if we look at the ACE study, which many of you are probably 
familiar with, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which was the largest public health study of 17,000 people, middle class people, and it was a primary health study looking at the impact of early childhood experiences and the direct correlation of adverse childhood experiences with primary health conditions. So what this study showed was that the higher your score, um, and you can do your own ACE score, if you Google ACE uh, questionnaire, you can look for yourself uh, what your score is in terms of your adverse childhood experience. And the higher the score, the greater chance there is of uh, incarceration, substance use, mental health conditions, unemployment, um, and chronic disease and early death. So we understand that this happens because our trauma lives in our biology. It affects our nervous system. And so if children are removed from their parents, if we're adopted, if we have an adverse childhood experience where there is toxic stress at home, if we're marinated in that toxic stress, it has an impact on our physicality and on our nervous system leading to chronic disease. So Bruce Perry has in his book Beyond the ACE Score pointed out that a person's history of connectedness is likely more important in determining their current health than their history of adversity. And I, I believe this to be true. As we look at the ACE score, and as a team, um, I've uh, conducted the, the ACE scores as a team, and we've shared our ACE score and what our adverse childhood experience was, and we've hypothesised to what makes a difference to why some people would end up with a mental health substance use concern or incarceration and early death and others with a high ACE score not go in that direction. And I think Bruce Perry has really pointed out something important here, our relationships, our opportunities of social support, interconnectedness, and our opportunities for early intervention will really interrupt um, that ongoing correlation to mental health substance use, incarceration, and early death. So Bezel van der Kolk, uh, I want to quote him here. He really has such a lot to share with us in his book, The Body Keeps Score. But he points out that if no one ever looked at you with loving eyes or broken out in a smile when they see you, if no one has rushed to help you, but instead said, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about, then you need to discover other ways of taking care of yourself you're likely to experiment with anything to ease the pain. So drugs, alcohol, binge eating or cutting, these things offer relief. So what is trauma-informed care? Well, trauma-informed care is an attitude. It's a lens through which all things are considered and made sense of. But it's also a framework with a set of principles. So you see here an image of a service system that is trauma-informed. It has at its foundation trauma-informed values and robust partnerships and champions. And it considers the environment. It considers that the environment needs to be calm and safe and empowering to both staff and clients. It screens and inquires about a current or lifelong experience of abuse and trauma and PTSD, and it responds with an integrated service response that really has great referral pathways and partnerships to attend to what's identified. So if a program, organisation or system is trauma-informed, it realises the centrality of trauma and the widespread impact. It thinks about re referral pathways for recovery but it also thinks about creating an environment of safety and care for both its staff and its clients. The main aim of trauma-informed care is to resist re-traumatisation. 
And so a service system will really be thinking about how it avoids re-traumatisation for, for the person presenting to the service, but also for our staff. So it's important when we think about trauma-informed care to think about what it's not. It's not trauma-focused treatment. So this is not about processing trauma. And I know that when we were first made aware of the impact of trauma for clients presenting for substance use, we were very eager to get everybody access to a trauma specialist. But that's not what trauma-informed care is about. In fact, it's really important for the client to have choice and control, to feel empowered, that they're in, ch in charge of when they decide to talk about their trauma and how they respond to that. It really is about creating a culture of understanding. It's creating physical and psychological safety for both the service providers and the clients. And it's about the whole system being educated to understand the signs and symptoms and to create safety so that every worker at every point of contact for the client is educated and trained in how to diffuse, how to support self-soothing, reducing distress and really respond to uh, the client's nervous system. And most importantly, it's about preventing unintentional re-traumatisation. So Fallot and Harris have been able to uh, give us some very key signs that a system is not trauma informed. So any system where clients are labelled or pathologised as manipulative or needy, attention seeking, drug seeking, over emotional, problematic, this is a sign that the system is not trauma informed care. So the language we use in talking about our clients uh, is a real indicator of how educated we are about trauma. The misuse or over display of power. So if the emphasis is on security, if demeanour and tone is about talking down to a client, this is a sign that the system is not trauma informed. If there's uh, a key role of workers as being rule enforcement or the tone of the setting is punitive in its boundaries, or if there's an emphasis on compliance rather than collaboration. Again, a sign that the system is not trauma informed. So anywhere that an agency disempowers or devalues clients or staff, this is passed on and disrespect of staff or devaluing staff or staff that are burnt out or systems where staff get burnt out, that has a flow on effect to the client's nervous system. So if you think about this list of characteristics of systems that are not trauma informed, can you think of systems that you've experienced that have these characteristics? Hopefully they're not in the AOD sector. But if I could share a couple with you for you to consider, um, perhaps the emergency department is a place that you've experienced uh, these characteristics. In the medical model, we can certainly um, feel that we're disempowered and that there is an emphasis of rule enforcement. Certainly in law enforcement, we see these characteristics in the child, protect, child protection sector uh, we might see these characteristics in the criminal justice system as well. So have a think about where you might see these signs that a system is not trauma informed. Certainly uh, there's room for uh, improvement in all of those sectors that I've, that I've named there. So I mentioned that trauma informed care is a set of principles, it's a framework. And there are six internationally recognised principles of trauma-informed care. They are safety, really thinking about the interpersonal safety, physical and emotional safety of both staff and clients. Trustworthiness, ensuring that we're not over-promising and under-delivering for clients, that we're transparent about what we have to offer. We're consistent and reliable we have appropriate boundaries. We're punctual if we say that we're going to 
do something for a client, we follow through, we make sure that we're reliable. We offer choice wherever possible. So giving the clients choice and control over as much as we can in regards to their involvement, in regards to their options, offering them options so that they have choice. It's a collaborative approach. It's about sharing power and being in partnership with our clients and looking for any opportunity to give voice to our clients. So advisory groups or co-design projects are one way to collaborate. It's about empowering clients. So if we think about trauma, we know that the experience of trauma disempowers and has our clients feeling hopeless, powerless. And so we want to ensure that we prioritise client empowerment and skill building. So it's a strength-based approach. It's a capacity building approach. It looks for opportunities of peer groups, co-design, uh, feedback, making sure that program development is really including the experience of our clients to see if there are areas of improvement based on their experience. And lastly, it's really taking into consideration the cultural, historical and gender issues around power so that we really are aware of abuses of power relating to these issues and we make every effort to uh, equalise that power with our clients. So essentially at every point of contact there is a safe, compassionate and co-occurring capable welcome and in my experience, uh, I was very fortunate to work with Minkoff and Klein over a number of years in our AOD outpatient counselling service. And this was their um, catch cry, I guess, welcome empathy and hope and having a co-occurring welcoming service system. And you can look up their work, but they have a range of tools and frameworks that support services to be co-occurring capable welcoming, empathic and hopeful, as well as trauma-informed. Another great resource is the Bouverie Centre uh, pamphlet, which you will get a copy of at the end of uh, this workshop. It's a really great thumbnail sketch of trauma-informed care and really thinking about the language that we use. So rather than saying, what is wrong with this person, we're asking what happened to this person. We're really mindful of the historical experience of our clients and really understanding their backstory. So rather than calling the client attention seeking, really understanding that they are showing signs and symptoms of trauma. So trauma-informed care is a strength-based approach as I said, it's avoiding labels. So we see the DSM getting bigger and bigger as each new um, DSM comes out. But the trauma-informed care approach is really avoiding the use of labels. It's using person-centred language. So a person who is using substances, a person who has a history of trauma, rather than talking about the BPD client or the frequent flyer or the complex manipulative client. So it really is bringing attention to our language, being shame sensitive, respectful and understanding that all behaviour is communication. I particularly like the metaphor from ACT therapy which says that people are not a mass problem to be solved or fixed but a sunset to be admired. So we don't look at a sunset and point out that the red could be more red or the orange more orange. We don't have a critical eye. We just admire the sunset. So in the same way, a trauma-informed care approach will admire what the client has done to survive. We will look for their strengths, their abilities, and their resources and their resourcefulness to thrive. So if you think about the people you serve using this lens, Think about what their strengths are. What do they do? And what have they done to survive? So in our considerations of trauma-informed care lens, it means that we see every person we meet as having a trauma history. 
we think about their behaviour as communication and need driven. And this may change how we view the person that we're working with. It may change our perceptions of their behaviour and their needs. If we see trauma as central and a core issue, how might this change the way you work? If you consider discussing as a team the six principles of trauma-informed care, you could explore how they could be integrated in your service delivery. You could reflect on the six principles of trauma-informed care on yourself as an individual worker. How do you integrate and how do you demonstrate uh, those principles in your work? You might consider doing an audit of your service to get a baseline of how trauma-informed you are. And there are a number of free quality improvement resources, one being the TickPot, which you can uh, look up and have a look at. But there are a number of audit tools available for your service to really get a sense of how trauma-informed you are against the six principles. So finally, we're going to look at the physiology of trauma. And you may be familiar with Dan Siegel, who gives us a really simple way of understanding our central nervous system and our brain. And he does this uh, by giving us a sense of our brain as our hand, what he calls the handy brain, which I've uh, shared with many clients and families, and understanding that uh, the thumb rep representing the amygdala and our palm, the limbic system, our hand, this is what our brain looks like behind our forehead, and our fingernails represent our prefrontal cortex. When we feel threatened, we get messages up our spinal cord that hit our amygdala and limbic system and our prefrontal cortex literally flips or goes offline. If we think about the functions of the prefrontal cortex or the CEO executive functioning of the brain, this is where our regulation is, where our rational thinking is, our ability to have moral reasoning, our empathy, these functions are all functions of the prefrontal cortex. So when we get threatened, these functions are literally offline. Think of the last time you flipped your lid. What was being threatened? Was it an opinion? Was it your space? Was it something that had you feeling anxious? And so we see that when we're impacted by trauma, this is particularly sensitive. Our body is scanning the environment for threat and the slightest indication of threat in our nervous system activates um, our limbic system, our fight flight response and our prefrontal cortex functions go offline. So you'll be getting a, a handout to look more at that but this is a great way of explaining what happens in our biology uh, to our clients and to their families. So taking this a step further, we see the emerging uh, thinking of Stephen Porges in polyvagal theory. And it's really quite a revolution because it helps us to understand perhaps why one person who has experienced the same trauma as a sibling, for example, has a different response or a different experience. We have an environmental trauma or incident and our nervous system, what uh, Stephen Porges calls neuroception, interprets both outside and inside the body uh, what that level of danger is. And so he's given us uh, an understanding of our nervous system that has three branches. So if our nervous system believes that the issue is the environment is safe or the person is safe, we have an optimal arousal level. We're able to rest and digest, we're able to have social engagement, we're able to have eye contact and uh, facial expression and we receive warm facial expression and are able to feel safe. If the nervous system believes that there is a danger or a threat and we need to take action, we become hyper aroused. And so our heart rate increases and our sympathetic 
nervous system is activated and we have the ability to mobilise the fight or flight response. And this is also where we see dissociated rage or panic. We have a nervous system that interprets the environment as dangerous and so we fight or flee. But if our nervous system sees that the threat is actually a life threat that we can't do anything about, we become hypo-aroused or we have a freeze response. And this is the response from our nervous system that causes dissociative disorders um, or depression or the shutting down of the nervous system, what's called the dorsal vagal system response and a dissociated collapse. So we actually know and have talked about for many years the fight-flight response, but we've had less appreciation or understanding that this freeze response um, is, is one for us to pay attention to when it comes to trauma and to know exactly how to respond to that. So our clients um, can understand this really well through uh, the tiger metaphor. So the fight response is uh, attacking the tiger. Our flight response is to run from the tiger. The freeze response is to hide. And another aspect of the, the freeze response is to fawn or to beg not to be eaten. So if we introduce our clients to understanding the nervous system response and to identify their particular signature response or how they respond to particular issues, it really empowers them to know exactly what, how their nervous system is responding. So here we have a, a photograph of uh, the branches of the nervous system. So the green being the ventral vagal is where we feel safe. I feel connected and I'm able to connect with you. And in order to activate the ventral vagal, we need a calm and welcoming environment. We need to feel safe. We need to know that we're in a safe environment and that we're feeling safe in our own skin. And you'll see that there's so much of the ventral vagal nerve in the facial expressions around our eyes and our jaw and our face. The sympathetic nervous system is the yellow uh, branches of the nervous system. So you can see that it's in our arms and our legs, it's connected to our heart and it's there in our throat, able to, to yell um, that we're able to fight or flee. And then the dorsal vagal is when we collapse. So that freeze response where we're unable to move. And you see this in animals when they're um, under threat that they freeze and play dead. And so their, their whole system shuts down. Where this causes uh, concern for our clients is that they get stuck in a sympathetic response or a fight response or a flea response. It becomes a stuck place or frozen in their body or they get stuck in a dorsal response. So the, the client that's depressed, the client who has no energy, the client who's shut down or dissociative is in a, a dorsal vagal activated response and, and really stuck there. I might just go back to that slide. So the ladder is from Deb Dana's work and she has a flip chart that um, you can educate clients on the polyvagal theory and their own nervous system and what's happening to their nervous system, giving them a vocabulary to really understand where their nervous system is at, where it's activated, where it's stuck, what they actually do and how they respond to threat and that enables you to have a conversation uh, with your clients about how to respond to their own nervous system. So we see that there is a hyperarousal response in the fight or flight or a hypoarousal in the freeze response. And our um, aim working with our clients is to increase their window of tolerance. So for some clients, the window of tolerance is really, really narrow. 
But in that window of tolerance, we're actually able to feel feelings. We're able to connect. We have a sense of self-control and, and we're able to relate. There's a sense of resilience when we're in that window of tolerance and we feel safe. When we're dysregulated, we're either in a hyper aroused state. So our nervous system is either raging or panicked or fearful and there's too much energy or we're in a hypo aroused state. We get dysregulated to the shutdown. Um, and you'll see this in your clients where there is a blankness or they're checked out. They're in an either trance state or they're feeling distant and far away. They have long pauses, uh, flat affect, and you can see in their posture and in how they organise themselves that they're in an I give up kind of state and they get stuck there. So we see that polyvagal theory helps us to understand the brakes and accelerator of our nervous system. And so if someone's in a hyper aroused state, we're going to think about things like breathing, um, teaching our clients to breathe, to take, pay attention to their breath, um, some mindfulness interventions, some sensory modulation, which you're going to have a webinar on in a, in a couple of weeks. And we're really wanting to co-regulate. So nervous systems talk to nervous systems and we want to provide a calm nervous system ourselves so that the client can co-regulate with us. If the client's hypo-aroused or in the freeze response, we actually want to activate some movement, some gentle rhythmic activities. Again, sensory modulation can be very helpful. Co-regulation is extremely important, creating a relationship of trust and thinking about some movement. So walking, stretching, music, um, gentle, slow rhythmic activities. So what we see when someone is traumatized that they may actually have the accelerator on and the brakes at the same time. So in the dorsal vagal activation, the brakes are actually shutting down on the accelerator and you have what is a, an internal residual revving of the system. And this causes um, consequential adrenal fatigue. And you can see how, why there is a direct correlation with trauma and autoimmune illnesses or chronic disease illnesses because uh, the person is actually stewing in their juice. Their nervous system is revving and working um, to excess and is stuck. So what polyvagal theory teaches us is that our nervous system is looking for cues of safety. And if it interprets that there are more cues for danger than safety, then it is going to activate a survival response. So our clients are going to present um, stuck in a story with either the fight response or the freeze response. If there are more cues for safety than danger, then the client is more ready for connection. They're more open to new possibilities. This is my favourite photograph of co-regulation. We're thinking about how our own nervous system regulates another's nervous system. So as a worker, it's really important that we calm our own nervous system first. If we're meeting with a client who's particularly agitated or aggressive or angry, we need to calm our own nervous system first so that we can co-regulate. Nervous systems talk to nervous systems. So they're interpreting threat or danger just by the energy in the room. So you'll know that by the environment when you feel safe in an environment or when you're with a person that you trust, you feel your nervous system calming down. When you're in an environment that feels threatening, your nervous system is dysregulated and activated. And so co-regulation is about empathising, validating, welcoming complaint, offering options and empowering the person. 
so that their nervous system can be calm and that they can activate their ventral vagal nerve. So in, in my history and in, in the work that um, uh, the, the organisational stress research did was really seeing the parallel processes of client, staff and organisations. So we see that when a client is feeling unsafe and staff are feeling unsafe and the organisation has systems that are feeling um, at th threat or risk, that it can really escalate um, the experience for clients and staff. So we see that there is a parallel process and the importance for our service systems to be safe, warm, um, aware of our staff wellbeing so that staff can be calm and respond appropriately to clients who are feeling unsafe. And particularly in the COVID situation, we see for the first time that uh, a lot of the experiences that the clients are, are anxious about are also experiences that staff and organisations are having to grapple with as well. So lastly, we're looking at uh, self-care. And so what I would say in being trauma-informed as, as a worker and thinking about your own self-care, the focus is thinking about your own nervous system. What do you need to stay in a ventral vagal response? What keeps you feeling grounded? What helps you to feel safe and connected? So in your own self-care from a trauma-informed lens, you're going to pay a lot more attention to your internal world, how calm you feel, the signature of your nervous system, um, whether you feel that you uh, are in a sympathetic response or a freeze response when you're responding to clients. So it is thinking about keeping the balance, knowing your own nervous system, knowing that self-care is not all about bath salts and chocolate, but it's being awake to activating ventral. So thinking about what you do for play, what you do for social connectedness, what you do in regards to your sleep hygiene, how you support yourself, whether it, um, you're having coffee uh, to stimulate you on a busy day and what impact that has on your nervous system or whether you're able to integrate some other practices that support a calm nervous system. The greatest service that you can offer your clients is to have a calm nervous system, to really know what it is that helps you to hold the space for them, that helps you to respond to a client who's dysregulated, who's hyper aroused or hypo aroused. And what's, what's going to help them most in that situation is for you to have a calm nervous system yourself. So having a trauma informed lens is really looking at the world through the understander scope. And this is Michael Lunig's cartoon. We're understanding that all behavior is need driven. All behavior is communication. We're looking at ourselves with understanding. We're understanding our own humanity, our own nervous system, our own um, dysregulation and really having strategies to support ourselves so that we can provide an empathic and welcoming response to our clients. So our final quote to think on before we go to questions is from Bezel van der Kolk. It's so important that we keep hope and that we think about post-traumatic growth and to understand that people who've experienced trauma have the ability uh, to transform and to really uh, live a life of resilience. So trauma constant, constantly confronts us with our fragility, our inhumanity to man, but also our extraordinary resilience. And most great instigators of social change have intimate personal knowledge of trauma. Trauma is now our most urgent public health issue and we have the knowledge necessary to respond effectively. The choice is ours to act on what we know. 
So the remaining slides are resources and links to videos, books that I recommend and people who've informed uh, my thinking in regards to this topic. So there's a lot there for you to explore and we look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Jen. That was um, really informative and such a comprehensive introduction. Thank you. We do have a number of questions mm -hmm. um, and a lot of interest in further resources, which um, Jen has been really generous in. Um, she's going to provide you with a really long list. Um, you also have access um, to the Bouverie document, which Jen referred to earlier, which will be forwarded out by Redback Studios later. Um, there won't be access to um, Jen's actual slides, um, but again, she's provided, you know, going to provide a really generous list of resources. Um, Jen, we did have one viewer who was really interested in the flip chart and just wanted a mm -hmm. reminder about where to access that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if you just Google Deb Dana flip chart polyvagal theory, it's fairly new. It hasn't been um, published for long, but uh, you'll be able to get that direct from Deb Dana. She'll have a website there or there are probably other stockists now who, who have that flip chart. The other educational flip chart that I didn't mention was Janina Fisher's flip chart as well on the impact of psychological trauma and that's also an, another great educational tool for clients, really easy to understand and explain to clients what's happening uh, for their own nervous system and biology. Thank you. Um, so just again that our email will come out at the end of this presentation with the resources. Um, we had another question. Um, can teaching clients mindfulness help them to self-regulate? Hmm, absolutely. So mindfulness uh, is a great intervention that activates the ventral vagal uh, system and helps them to really take charge and empower them in terms of uh, their body. I would only caution around uh, where there's dissociation um, and meditation. So depending on what you're referring to, mindfulness is about being aware of our, our senses, our smells, the touch, our sensory modulation, really slowing down our awareness and being mindful of uh, the present moment. And I think that's, that's a really helpful way of feeling in charge of our own um, sense of self. But I think where there's meditation or uh, workers asking clients to close their eyes, for example, that could be triggering or traumatising. So really thinking about what choice and control does the client have. Uh, they can keep their eyes open if you're doing a mindful activity. Um, and just being aware of keeping, keeping the intervention in the external environment initially, just to see how the client responds. So noticing the room, noticing smells, sounds, noticing the breath. Uh, really, uh, breath training is probably the most powerful intervention and it's, it's the intervention I teach all of my clients um, on, on how to really regulate breath as an anchor for the nervous system. And it's really keeping that, that self-regulation in the nervous system and, and having a sense of I can actually be in charge of my own nervous system. Thank you. Mm. Another question, is self-harming behaviour in adolescence always a sign of past trauma or can it just be a sign of poor coping mechanisms? Uh, so I, I would say that it's, it's communication. So self-harm is you know, meeting a need for the person and it's, it, it has so many different meanings for the person. Um, it could be a way of alleviating overwhelming feelings. It could be a way of um, really feeling some relief. It could be a way of just feeling. It could be that they are feeling numb and they're cutting uh, to actually feel. So there's so many reasons why uh, someone would self-harm. Uh, if, if that person would like to um, email me, there is a great resource on, on self-harm 
uh, that's a great booklet and gives alternatives to self-harm uh, for adolescents. So, um, yeah, okay. I'd, I'd love to give that out to whoever Thank that you, person Jane. is. <laughs> um, someone else also interested in just uh, directions of how to access the Handy Brain information. Yeah, so if you Google Dan Siegel Handy Brain, there's lots of uh, YouTube clips of him actually going through the Handy Brain um, and even if you Google Handy Brain, I think you'll actually get the PDF with the script of um, the Handy Brain and of the diagram of the brain. It's a great intervention uh, to to do with clients to teach them about you know how how um, aggression in particular or how we actually get angry as a defence to threat and how to actually intervene early. So Dan Siegel's teaching children the handy brain in kindergarten. So if children in kindergarten can learn about um, the handy brain, it's certainly something that we adults uh, to, to actually know the biology of our brain. And I guess there'd be some neuroscientists that think it's a pretty crass way of describing the brain, but it is a really easy way of knowing what's going on in our biology. Um, and to get some kind of control by early intervention. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, how do you think the alcohol and drug sector is going in terms of being, um, you know, trauma informed <laughs> in practice? And yeah. In practice? Yeah. Look, I think it's it's kind of been an interesting topic. It's it's emerged and then it's taken a back seat and it's emerged and taken a back seat. I think it's an area that we really need to be educated um, as a sector to uh, have our, not only our workers educated, but our service systems trauma informed. And I think if you look at the audit tools um, that assess the baseline of organisations that are trauma informed, you really see how much we need to grow and improve in, in this area, looking at the service system and processes. So there's lots of ways the service system unintentionally re-traumatises our clients now in the AOD sector. Um, lots of ways in which we, we do that unintentionally just because of the way the system works and the processes that are there. Um, so I think there's lots of room for improvement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe one final question. How do we best practice trauma-informed care in a punitive environment such as prisons? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the prison system <laughs> needs a revolution, if I can say that. Uh, I think um, certainly, it, you know, schools are, are really taking this seriously and having a more trauma-informed approach. Um, and we see that this is happening you know, with leadership from the states in response to school shootings and so on. Uh, but I think, yeah, the prison system being trauma informed, that that's a really uh, challenging service system to change. All that we can do as workers, and, and, and this is true of clients as well, we can only control what's within our sphere. Um, for us to be trauma informed, we can do that as an individual. We can influence our colleagues. We can influence uh, service systems by uh, bringing what we learn um, and know about trauma-informed care to our managers, to our um, service, other service sectors that we're in relationship with. Um, and that's, I think, change happens at a local level, at an individual level, but the macro, the macro change, um, you know, hopefully as, as we change uh, as a sector, we will have wider influence on the other sectors that we touch. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Jen, um, for so generously sharing your time. Um, would like to encourage everyone to stay on today and complete the feedback survey. Um, just a reminder, if you didn't receive the message, that there is a, a blue icon where you'll be able to access the resources. Um, but yeah, please, complete the survey, let us know, is there other topics you'd like to hear about? Is there other presenters that you'd like to hear from? Um, and, you know, certainly have a look at Jen's website and the work that she's now doing privately. Um, and thank you again. Thanks very much. Anything else you want to say? 
I'm really excited to be sharing this topic and hoping that everyone who's jumped on board today uh, will, will continue to do your own research and follow through on uh, the readings and the links and to learn all you can about trauma-informed care. It will really transform how you work and it will actually reduce your stress, guaranteed. Thank yeah. you. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you, everyone. That's, um, that's us finished for today.